there are two passages in the bulletin, uh, one in Ezekiel and in Revelation uh, for our scripture reading. I'm actually adding a brief reading uh, in Isaiah as well, chapter 6, just the first few verses here. These are three uh, visions of God's throne room, three prophetic visions of God's throne room and uh, of the Lord who sits on the throne. So first in Ezekiel chapter 1, we'll read verses 1 through 14. Remembering that this is God's inspired and inerrant word. Now it came about in the thirteenth year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was standing by the river Kebar among the uh, exiles, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, in the fifth year of King uh, Jehoiachin's exile, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, and there the hand of the Lord came upon him. As I looked, behold, a storm, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it, and in the midst, something like, a gl like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet were like calves' hoof, and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, were human hands, and for them, the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings, or rather, as for them, the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved and went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left. And all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covering their bodies. Each went straight forward wherever the spirit was about to go. They would go without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning fires of coal. or rather burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, and the lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Isaiah 6, verse 1, In the year of Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each had, having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory." And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Revelation chapter 4, uh, the second part of verse 6 to the end of the chapter is our text. We'll begin reading at verse 1. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius, a sardius rather, and in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne there were 24 thrones, 
And upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature was like a, uh, like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature like a flying e eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before the, him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Be seated, Amen. please. Let's pray together. We pray to you, O oh God, the one who is enthroned in heaven. And we enter into the throne room now together to seek your face, once again to call upon your name and to ask that you would be pleased, O oh God, from the throne to send forth the seven spirits of the throne, uh, even the Holy Spirit in all his perfections, to minister in our hearts through your revealed word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The open door and Christ's heavenly summons to come up here in verse 1. Initiate John's summons as a prophet to enter the throne room of the king of kings, to hear his plans and his purposes, and then communicate uh, those plans and purposes to God's people, to God's people uh, of the first century, and to God's people today. If there's one word that dominates this fourth chapter of Revelation, it's the term throne which appears 13 times in 11 verses. It occurs 37 times in the book of Revelation, but it's chapter 4 that describes the throne and the one who sits on the throne uh, by means of theophany, this visible manifestation of, of God. And the purpose of this theophany is to communicate that God is the supreme ruler of the universe. The main theme of this passage is the centrality of heaven's throne. John sees a symbolic representation of heaven's throne. The sovereign rule of, of the one who sits on the throne, those who reign on thrones with him, and those who worship around heaven's throne. So we sought to uh, uh, interpret this extraordinary uh, symbolism 
in these first six verses, we said that God saw the sovereign universe, uh, the sovereign ruler, rather, on the throne as the God of light, uh, who is identified with the new Jerusalem, uh, the church, uh, with God's people in, in the new covenant, as the holy lawgiver of Mount Sinai, who's identified with, God, with his people of old, uh, who exercises his rule by the Holy Spirit's agency, and is the covenant God of peace around heaven's throne. Uh, we are reminded again, as we read this chapter in its entire, entirety, are two remarkable gatherings. 24 elders uh, here uh, in verse 4, and four living creatures described to us in verses six, uh, 6 and 7. Having considered heaven's throne, the one who sits on it, those who reign with him, in today's text we're uh, considering Worship around heaven's throne. And we'll look at two things here. In the first place, the identity of those who worship around heaven's throne. The identity of those who worship around heaven's throne. And then secondly, the worship of those around heaven's throne. First then, the identity of those who worship around heaven's heaven's throne. Now, some of this is by way of review, uh, in particular the identity of the 24 elders. I mentioned last week that while interpreters disagree as to the significance of, of the, the symbolism of the number uh, of the elders, uh, um, the, some interpreters think otherwise, but the traditional view, and I think the, the right view, is that these 24 elders correspond to the 12 patriarchs of Israel and the 12 apostles, which parallels the two sets of 12 in the New Jerusalem, described in Revelation 21, verses 12 through 14, the 12 gates of pearl, bearing the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and the twelve foundation stones bearing the names of the twelve apostles. That view uh, sees the Old Testament patriarchs and the New Testament apostles as symbolizing those who are redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, and more particularly, those who are now glorified in heaven as they sit on thrones, uh, represented by these 24 elders sitting on thrones around uh, the central throne of heaven. Both the elders and the four living creatures uh, worship the Lord, but it's only said of the elders that, that they rule with uh, with. God, the one who sits on the throne. The angels are never said to rule. It's interesting. Uh, we, we don't know a lot about angels. We know some. The, the Bible reveals some things. We can, we can glean a number of things about angels. But one of the interesting things is uh, that while, uh, as Jonathan Edwards said, uh, angels are greater in power, humans are greater in grace. Now, why is that? It's because Christ didn't die for the sins of angels. Christ didn't redeem any angels by his blood. He redeemed his human elect creatures by his blood. We could also say that uh, God's people are greater than angels in the sense that they rule with God, while angels are never said to rule we noted last week that what's being revealed in our text is of great significance, and we're coming back to this later uh, as we wind things up, but um, I said to you that uh, the saints of the Old Testament, together with those who have died thus far in the New Testament, aren't only alive, 
they are reigning with God and reigning with Christ in heaven. And that was a great comfort to the many first century believers who had lost family members or, uh, or uh, friends to, to martyrdom. But you see, it's not only the martyrs who are reigning with God around the throne. It's not only martyrs who are among the glorified saints in heaven gathered around uh, the throne. It's all of God's glorified saints, all who have died in Christ, all the Christian dead are ruling. And this gives us, gives us great comfort uh, with regard to our own uh, loved ones and friends who have gone on to be with the Lord. Again, we'll come back uh, to that later. But these are co-regents with God. The glorified saints of heaven are co-regents with God. And that's a wondrous uh, thing. That brings us into the identity of the four living beings. The four living creatures seen by John here, uh, Revelation 4, verses 6 through 8, share characteristics of the four living creatures that Ezekiel saw on the throne of God. We've read Ezekiel chapter 1, and in particular, verses 5 through 14, uh, show uh, these creatures bearing uh, the throne of God. Ezekiel calls them cherubim later on in his prophecy, chapter 10 and verse 20. But they also resemble the seraphim of Isaiah's temple vision and the Lord on his throne, lofty and exalted. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Each of the four living creatures in Ezekiel's vision had four faces that of a lion. A man, a lion, a young bull, and an eagle. Whereas in John's vision, the, the living creatures have, each have one face. A lion, a young bull, or an ox, as your translation may have it, a man, and an eagle. Although Ezekiel's living creatures had four wings, John's have six, like the seraphim seen by Isaiah. In John's vision, of the living creatures call ceaselessly, as they do in Isaiah's vision. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And like the wheels associated with Ezekiel's living creatures, John's living creatures are full of eyes in front and behind, reflecting the omniscience of of the one whom they worship. Perhaps the most significant difference between Ezekiel and Revelation is the absence of these wheels in John's vision. Why is that? Well, it's because God's people in Israel of old were in a different position than God's people in the first century. Uh, Ezekiel's vision assures the exiles in Babylon that despite the temple's destruction and their deportation, the Lord had not retracted his promise of his presence with them, but would travel with them. The wheels, wheels travel, don't they? Wheels move, and these wheels did move. Uh, they moved to and fro. And that's what these wheels uh, uh, representing uh, God's throne uh, in Ezekiel's vision uh, symbolize for us. That God would travel with them to the place of their captivity. John's vision opens to the besieged church's view through heaven's door, a glimpse of our God's tranquil so uh, sovereignty over earth's turmoil. So 
similar situations and uh, uh, in old and new, but not quite the same. And, and each of these uh, adapted for God's people of the age to which they were first delivered. And and that's what, as one of um, uh, my former professors, who's uh, I've, I've benefited greatly from his uh, commentary on uh, Revelation, uh, has, has written very profoundly here. We may be confused by uh, the resemblance and variation between John's vision and those of his Old Testament predecessors in prophecy, but the prophetic vocabulary of simile should lead us to expect this fluidity. We should expect things to change with, uh, depending on the context, the original context of, uh, of these prophetic writings. Prophetic vision isn't intended to provide photographic reproduction of what angelic beings such as cherubim and seraphim look like. Rather, in prophetic vision, God adapts to the need of the moment. The visual metaphors by which he portrays aspects of truth about himself and these heavenly courtiers, those who tend to the court of heaven's throne. All of the main activity of the four living creatures in Revelation is worship. It's interesting. Uh, They'll also implement the judgments that are ordered by the Lord. That's what's coming up after this fourth chapter. Judgment upon judgment. And it's it's these uh, four living creatures that, that implement these judgments uh, in response to the lambs breaking the first four seals on the scroll of God's plan, the living creatures in succession summon the four riders on white, red, black, and ashen horses to come and, and bring afflictions of judgment upon the earth, Revelation 6, verses 1 through 8. When the climax of judgment arrives, one of the living creatures will give the seven bowls of God's wrath to the angels who are going to pour them out upon the earth, Revelation 15.7. Since these four living creatures resemble the cherubim of Ezekiel's vision, their presence also recalls the cherubim's role as guardians who keep defilement out of God's holy habitation. Uh, John's vision is is of God's holy habitation, isn't it? It's of the throne room of heaven. It's of the holy of holies itself, the holy of holies. The tabernacle, the the temple holy of holies, is a copy of, of the holy of holies in heaven. And they're situated around the throne. What's probably, although we can't tell with any degree of certainty, but it's fun to speculate about it, they're probably around the throne on each side and then behind and in front, directly on each side behind and in front. And as such, they are guardians to the throne of the holy of holies. And this happens elsewhere with regard to cherubim, whether it's Eden. Remember the, the cherubim who guarded Eden after uh, Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, Genesis 3.24, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the cherubim, uh, the two cherubim which were on, uh, on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which, which guarded that which was contained above of the cherubim, uh, God's dwelling place, or between the cherubim, however, uh, however we, we, we translate that. The holy of holies in the temple as well, 1 Kings 6, chapter 23 through 28. Each of these is an earthly replica of the heavenly throne room in which God sits between or above the cherubim as 
Uh, Psalm 80, verse 1, 99, verse 1, Isaiah 37, verse 16, all reveal to us the precise identification of the four living creatures with faces of a lion, a calf or bull, a man, an eagle, is uncertain. The church fathers, such as Origen and Athanasius, saw the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, depicted by these four symbols. As someone has said, their allegorical approach to interpretation testifies to their imagination, but doesn't lend any help in understanding Revelation. Others say the four living creatures are, are, are cherubim, uh, the highest order of uh, the angels, symbolizing the fullness of power inherent to the divine nature, since each of these animals is, uh, can be seen as the head of their species, who, whose appearance represent the attributes of, of God. Uh, the, the creature uh, like a lion is a symbol of God's power. The uh, the creature like a calf or ox speaks of God's faithfulness. Uh, the, the creature with the face of a man denotes God's intelligence. And uh, the creature like a flying eagle expresses God's sovereignty. Still others say the activity of these four uh, figures ultimately represent the whole created order of animate life. Uh, God's sovereignty over all his creation and all powers within uh, his creation. Um, Herman Hoxema, it's a great name, uh, great Dutch uh, theologian, uh, Dutch Reformed theologian, writes this Four is the number that is symbolic of all creation in all its fullness. Think of the four winds of heaven and the four corners of the earth. In their number, therefore, uh, they therefore represent the entire creation. What the lion is among the beasts of the field, the ox is among the cattle, man is among uh, the intelligent creatures, and the eagle is among the, bird, uh, the birds of the air. Much like Ezekiel's similar vision of four living creatures, uh, there in Ezekiel 1, John's vision indicates that God is sovereign in all created realms. He's always on the throne. He is sovereign over all. These living beings, these angelic creatures in heaven, whether they're cherubim or seraphim, we can't really tell. But like the cherubim and seraphim, they proclaim God's holy attributes, they fill heaven with his worship, and they guard God's throne. They do this continually. They're in constant motion with six wings and eyes all around. They fly in any direction and from every quarter. They form the closest circle around the throne. They represent the truth that God is the focal point of worship for all the assembled powers of the universe as he sits on his throne in the holy of holies of heaven itself. So much for the identity of those who worshipped around heaven's throne. Secondly, the worship of those around heaven's throne. The worship, I'm going to look closely at, at what these, how these living beings and how the 24 elders, how the church glorified worships of the Lord in heaven. The, the living beings, verse 8, around God's throne in heaven continually say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. In this angelic worship 
before God's throne. The words, Lord God Almighty, proclaim uh, the truth of God's omnipotence. Nothing and no one in all creation can rival the Almighty. It's he who said, I am the Lord and there is no other. He is the one who was and who is and who is to come. These words describe God as timeless from eternity to eternity. The angel's description refers to God as the occupant of the throne and the one who dwells in eternity. Their praise denotes him as the the giver of life, which is eternal. The four living creatures receive their life from God. They fulfill his commands, and they joyfully proclaim his praises. The emphasis is on the number four, and that uh, relates to, to God's creation. Similarly, the the clause, the one who lives forever and ever, appears four times uh, in Revelation. Not only here in verse 9, but also in chapter 10 and verse 6 and 15, 7. Verses 9 and 10 here in chapter 4 and then 10, 6 and 15, 7. God is the creator who eternally rules over his creation. These four living beings ascribe glory, honor, and thanks to God. Glory and honor relate to God's perfection, but thanksgiving to his gifts in both creation and redemption. Didn't time it this way, but this is a fitting text, isn't it? For season in which we find ourselves in, uh, in the week of, of thanksgiving. We ought to be ascribing to God glory and honor and thanksgiving. Glory and honor and thanksgiving to the one who sits on the throne. The inscription of glory and honor and thanks by these four living beings prompts the 24 elders to fall on their faces before God's throne, rendering homage to the Almighty alone. It's remarkable how many times in Revelation the 24 elders are mentioned falling before the one seated on the throne to worship him. Uh, Chapter 5, verses 8 and 14, chapter uh, 7, verse 11, Chapter 11, verse 16, chapter 19, and verse 4. The story is told uh, that when Handel's Messiah was first performed in London in 1743, in the presence of King George II, the king rose from his seat with his head bowed upon hearing the hallelujah chorus, indicating that not he, but Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Messiah reigns forever and ever. The 24 elders cast their thrones before God's throne and render to him the highest praises in heaven and on earth. They had received these crowns from the one who sits on the throne for being overcomers. But they respectfully return them to God to assign to him all glory and honor because he alone lives and rules forever. You remember that Satan tempted Jesus to bow down and worship him. But the Lord, you remember, responded by quoting Scripture. In all three instances of that temptation, he he 
responded by quoting scripture. In this case, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Satan has his own throne. We, at least it's described as uh, 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 Satan's throne earlier in these letters to the seven churches. But as, as history moves on toward the consummation, in that consummation, he will be consumed by the lake of fire. So not Satan, although he's called the ruler of this world, is indeed in control, but God alone is in control and alone is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. So say the 24 elders on their throne. So say the church triumphant in heaven. So say the glorified saints of old and new covenants who reside with God. And who worship him in the holy of holies. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. The successive songs in chapter 5, verses 9 and 12, have this adjective, worthy, as their opening word. Worthy, 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 Revelation shouts to us. No one in the entire universe is worthy of glory and honor, and power. But God and the Lamb. No one is worthy but God because of creation. And then the Lamb is worthy because of, of redemption, his sacrificial death. So the Lamb alone is worthy to execute God's plan of redemption and to fill the role of king in his kingdom, the lamb alone is worthy to open the scrolls of judgment. The difference between uh, this proclamation uh, of the four living creatures, I think it was a, a hymn, uh, but whatever it is, uh, they, were, they were certainly saying something. Uh, they were proclaiming something, singing it or not. Uh, the difference between the, four, the proclamation of the four living creatures in verse 8 and, and that of the 24 elders in verse 11 is that the angelic beings glorify God as holy, almighty, and eternal, while the elders glorify God for his work of creation. And then, uh, instead of the word thanks of verse 9, the song uh, here in verse 11 has this expression of power, God's power. Oh, that's, that is something in common between the two, these two uh, proclamations. God's power uh, is revealed in his creating all things in this vast universe in which we exist. It's hard for us to even get a grasp on the vastness uh, of this universe, let alone fully appreciate uh, all that God has created. Although we do, we can, we can pause and uh, enjoy the beauty of, of God's uh, creation as we gaze upon majestic mountain peaks or the vastness of the ocean or, or, or the stars uh, that shine so brilliantly in, uh, in the heavens. Surely we do, but we can never fully grasp the vastness of the power 
by which God created the heavens and the earth. The Creator has made all things from the smallest particle to the largest star in the universe. So the work of creation is the elders a reason. The angelic creatures, these four living beings, prompted them to fall on their faces. But the ground for their worship, the ground for uh, the worship of the, the saints in glory is God's power as creator. Notice they call him our Lord and our God. Uh, in the succeeding song, in chapter 5 and verse 9, they praise the Lord Christ for purchasing them for God. The refrain concludes the refrain of the 24 elders, the refrain of, uh, of the, the saints glorified in heaven concludes, and because of your will they existed and were created. The work of creation depends entirely upon God's will. Without his will, nothing happens. In other words, this world didn't come into existence on its own, out of the primordial mass. Rather, God exercised his will and created everything in the universe as we know it. Hebrews 11 and verse 3 makes clear. And so the whole creation must worship God, all things. Even the inanimate part of creation must give glory to God. It can't help but give glory to God because that's the way he created it. As the sun makes its circuit, rising at one end of the earth and setting on the other. The heavens tell of the glory of God and all animate things in the world, humanity, animals, and plant worlds, and other inanimate things exist only because of God's will. And that means everything in creation must worship him and serve him. last part of this verse uh, has been interpreted in various ways, in part because there are some textual uh, variances here in, the, in the, the Greek. But it's puzzling because the logical sequence should be they were created and therefore existed. That's how we would think of it uh, uh, logically, I, I think, if we employ our logic. It's imprecise wording. Uh, the, the reading really ought to be in the present tense, they exist, uh, which is the reading supported by some Greek manuscripts, and uh, you'll see that reflected in the New King James Version. Some Greek manuscripts actually delete the words they were created uh, to alleviate the problem uh, presented here. The explanation suggested by a number of commentators, is that the expression, they existed, looks back to the fact of creation, and the expression, they were created, has to do with the beginning of creation. They existed looks back to the fact of creation. They were created has to do with the beginning of their existence. Whatever the case, the will of God is the cause of this creation, and the Lord Christ, we know, is the agent of this creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, 
He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. This is a fitting conclusion, this last clause of this fourth chapter. Because of your will, they existed and were created. A fitting conclusion to the account of God's throne room. God is sovereign in his creation. Because he's sovereign, he must be worshipped by everyone and all things in heaven and on earth. The point of Revelation chapter 4 is that all things and all people in heaven and earth should praise and honor God because he is the creator and sustainer of all. The four living creatures proclaim his infinite, eternal, and unchanging holiness as the sovereign God and the 24 elders representing the church triumphant worship him as their creator. The the elders take off their crowns and cast them before the feet of the sovereign God on the throne, declaring that he alone is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Revelation 4 declares that God is sovereign in grace and in nature, in the church and in creation. And worship is all about our response to this one who sits on the throne. Worship is giving him praise and adoration that is due to his holy name. The more we know of God, the more childlike our faith ought to become and the more humble we ought to be. in prostrating ourselves before the one who sits on the throne. We can't know too much about God because it impinges upon our worship of him. And this is something that that can never be overemphasized. God's creative and sustaining sovereignty is the basis for worship. It's what we come to do. Anytime we worship before the throne, God's will is ultimate, not man's will, not the church's will, but God's will alone. He creates And he sustains to fulfill his own purpose. Daniel chapter 4 verse 35 embodies uh, this great truth. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? That's what drives our worship, dear Christians. It's this sovereign one on the throne. It's what drove the worship of the 24 elders in John's vision, the church triumphant. It's what drove the worship of these angelic beings in heaven. It's what drives that worship now. And it's what ought to drive our worship of the sovereign creator. Heaven 
will eternally reflect this great truth. And our earthly worship ought to seek to conform to it. Do you see how far a casual approach to worship misses the mark? If we can come before God casually and address him as our buddy, then we do not know the God of heaven. We do not know this one seated upon the throne, and we need to go back and look at our Bibles to see what God has revealed about himself. So we've said the Christian dead are beloved family members and, and friends acquaintances who've gone on to be with the Lord are not only alive and not only uh, reigning as co-regents with God, but they are now worshiping before the throne of God. And that just gives us another slice of of the comfort that we ought to take with regard to our uh, believing loved ones because what that means is that when we worship, we are worshiping with them as they worship in heaven. And that's a remarkable thing, isn't it? Maybe hard for us to get our minds around. Maybe hard for us to grasp this reality. But it's true, and the writer to the Hebrews tells us uh, that, that it's so. He speaks of, uh, speaks in chapter uh, 12, He's, there's a contrast of, of uh, Sinai and, and Zion. Uh, you've not come to Mount Sinai. He goes on to describe uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, listen, listen to what he says in contrast. Uh, to Sinai. When he describes uh, Mount Zion, you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, so not only of the saints triumphant around God's throne, but myriads of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of The righteous made perfect. That's who these 24 elders represent. The righteous made perfect of the church of all ages, old covenant and new. And the writer to the Hebrews, whoever he is, whether Paul or someone else, says to us that we are raptured up with them into heaven to worship with them when we worship. And there's another marvelous truth with regard to that worship that we on earth render to the one who sits on the throne, and that is that it's made possible by our Lord Jesus Christ. John could have never gone up into heaven, been raptured up into heaven, and gone through that open door to see the throne of God. And the one who sits on that throne, unless Christ had beckoned him to come. And we could never worship as we do in the Holy of Holies in heaven unless Christ had paved the way for us on the cross at Calvary. You remember what happened? when Jesus breathed his last on the cross. All of the synoptic gospels record this. Matthew, Mark, Luke. The veil that separated the holy place and the holy place was ripped apart, ripped into 
signifying that the way into the Holy of Holies is made possible through the veil. Remember the writer of Hebrews said, that is his flesh. Sacrifice for us. On that cross, on a hill called Golgotha. Dear Christians, this is wondrous in our eyes. Amen. 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 Lord, you are indeed holy, holy, holy. The Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. You're worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things. Because of your will, they existed and were created. Increase our knowledge, O God, of your omnipotence, of your eternality, of your holy character. Give us a greater understanding. We know, O oh Lord, that we won't see any visions. We won't be enraptured into heaven to see visions of God. But nevertheless, O oh Lord, you've given us your word. We pray that you would make your holy character, and powerful, creative, and and sustaining nature more and more evident to us so that our worship here on earth will reflect the worship that is given in heaven around your holy throne. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.